going to be. Thank you, Grit. Um, so uh, yeah, we we're, we're just recording um, the papers, um, as uh, hopefully you're aware. Um, okay, thank you. Welcome, very uh, welcome to everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to this second uh, webinar in our series of webinars for the Knowing the Secret Police um, project. This um, webinar has the title Theoretical and Interdisciplinary Approaches to Secrecy and Knowledge. Um, so I'm going to chair, I'm Sarah Jones, um, I'm co-investigator on the Knowing the Secret Police project, um, particularly working on the literary network strand um, of, of the research, um, literary, literary networks and, and literary representations. Um, so I'm really excited uh, by the three papers that we've got today. Um, they look uh, like they're going to complement each other really well, but also approach the questions around um, secrecy and knowledge and, and our conceptualization of those things from quite, quite different perspectives. Um, so I will introduce each speaker before their paper um, and then um, if they can they can speak for 15 minutes. Um, I will stop you at 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I, what we've done, what I've seen done in the past, which I think works quite well, just to give you a bit of a warning, is I'll turn my camera off while you're speaking, but when you've got two minutes to go, I'll turn it back on. Um, so when you see me come back on screen, then you know that you've got two, two minutes um, left to speak, because uh, otherwise it's quite difficult to get people's attention um, on, on Zoom webinars. Um, and then uh, once we've had all three papers, then we should have a significant amount of time for discussion, which I think is, is great in terms of bringing the, the different disciplinary perspectives together on, on these topics. OK, um, so our first paper is um, by Dr. Vita Peacock um, with the title Digital Initiation Rights. Um, so in her abstract, she says this talk examines the logic of exposure of hidden information that bounds adherence to the UK anonymous movement in the 2010s. Drawing on studies of initiation and secret societies, it develops the concept of digital initiation to theorize the role of secret knowledge in the forms of politicization now occurring widely online. Uh, Vita is based at the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London, um, and is currently PI on the ERC project, Surveillance and Moral Community. Um, so very much in the area of the, of, uh, that we're, we're really interested in. Uh, she's a political anthropologist uh, with interests in hierarchy, social movements, and the politics of digital society in both Germany and Britain. Um, she's published a number of articles on hierarchy um, and her manuscript, Digital Initiation Rights, um, is currently under review. Uh, thank you very much, Vita. The floor is yours, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, um, for that introduction. And thank you, Grit, also for the original invitation to be here, um, as well as to the whole research group. I'm really um, fascinated by the conjunctures that you're bringing together in this project. So I'm looking forward to coming to some of the other webinars as well. Um, so the research um, began in late 2013 when I set out to explore the effect of government austerity on public life in Britain, and in particular on the political aspirations and world making of emerging social movements. And shortly after I began the fieldwork, I decided to focus on the social movement that called itself anonymous, which was most obviously identified by the iconography of its infamous Guy Fawkes mask. Now, Anonymous, as I'm sure most of you know, emerged quite early in the 21st century, around 2006, um, online. It's a so-called born digital phenomenon. And as studied by Gabriella Coleman, engaged in high profile acts of computer hacking that took a broadly left libertarian slant. And this particular incarnation of Anonymous probably still exists in some form um, although <laughs> the title sort of gives it away that it's always difficult to know uh, what or who Anonymous is. Um, uh, but it has certainly um, entered the headlines again in the middle of the war in Ukraine uh, with their latest operation Op Russia. Um, but this incarnation of Anonymous that I studied ethnographically and my final interview took place in 2017, so it was over a four year uh, time span that I got to know uh, my research participants. Um, 
was actually was one that actually assembled not just in the virtual public sphere, but also in the physical um, public sphere across the urban spaces of Britain, and was populated by people who were in fact beyond the basic competence that we all now have, um, non-tech savvy, non-computer savvy, and who identified themselves and each other simply by wearing these masks. And so the main question which really drove the research forwards was, you know, what was it that bound these people together, if, it, if not technical skill, most of whom did not know each other beforehand, and a not unsubstantial proportion of whom had no previous experience of activism. What did it mean then to appear on the streets of the UK and say that they were anonymous? And this is where we meet the theme of this series, because what really united these people was the possession of a certain form of knowledge. Um, and here, um, having thought actually more deeply about this question since the invitation to be here, I would animate a distinction between secret knowledge and hidden knowledge because anons, as they called themselves, had all in some way or another acquired a knowledge that had previously been hidden from them in a process of radical subjective change that they called waking up. And my own extended analysis of Anonymous thus turns around the endeavor to draw out, articulate, and ultimately theorize what waking up really consisted of anthropologically. And in this endeavor, I gathered dozens of these narratives. Um, some were just a few minutes long, um, others several hours long, um, from people who were in some way committed to the movement. And this was triangulated with online research as well as participant observation at protests and other events. Um, so to start concretely, there are two main things that characterize waking up as it materialized ethnographically. Uh, the first is that although these transformations are clearly taking place within social milieu at various scales, waking up is experienced and narrated as an entirely individual phenomenon. The second is that waking up hinges on digital mediation. There was no example in these narratives that did not in some sense relate to the learning of information online. And significantly, many of these forms of learning were audiovisual. So YouTube and other audiovisual file sharing platforms featured frequently in which anons would talk about the truths that they had learned online because they had seen them. And the fact that this was a mediated digital witnessing rather than actual witnessing seemed to make amazingly little difference. And this process of uncovering information online that was previously hidden to them instantiates, um, as Sarah introduced, the wider logic of exposure that has defined Anonymous since its inception. And we can think of this logic of exposure as what Dumont called the, the paramount value or the, the axial value which brings this movement together and also creates the forms of social differentiation that it produces within and beyond it. And this is vis clearly visible first and foremost in the heroes of the movement. Um, so Anons have consistently venerated and lionized people involved in some way in the revelation of information. Uh, one of its first major hacks, so-called Project Chanology in 2010, was designed as an explicit act of revenge for the seizure of financial assets of the whistleblowing organization WikiLeaks. Um, and Julian Assange is still very much a hero and now indeed a martyr of the movement. Likewise, when Edward Snowden exposed the National Security Agency's domestic surveillance program in 2013, he assumed an almost deific character for Anons. And these eruptions of massive secret data sets into the public sphere that whistleblowers like these are engaged in clearly follows the grain um, discursively set by American evangelical Christianity and its eventful discourses of revelation. In these, the unknown invisible world in a, in a religious sense, namely God, suddenly materializes in the form of a visible truth to the believer, 
Um, and the influence of American evangelical discourses on anonymous is very palpable um, in lots of different ways. And in fact, um, particularly in the, the American political context has a very long and documented genealogy. So it might be tempting to see this dynamic of waking up and its relationship to truth as a straightforward Christian conversion narrative. However, not only is this a very self-consciously secular movement, which defines itself in direct opposition to institutional religion, but its main symbol and political prop, namely the Guy Fawkes mask, brings these processes of transformation much closer to initiation albeit a historically novel form of it, that hinges on the affordances of digital sociality. And this is what I call digital initiation rights. And now I wanna just take some time to define this term in a more abstract way than I have so far. Although it is a sequence, a digital initiation right is not a ritual. These processes of subjective change are taking place outside of any ritual orchestration in a manner that is ostensibly self-authored. The potential for digital initiation takes hold, however, like its predecessor, ritual initiation, in subjective conditions of symbolic death, a profound experience of social invisibility that disassembles one's existing links to the social world. And also like its predecessor, digital initiation turns around the acquisition of knowledge. And the major theorists of ritual initiation that I draw in extensively, Messia Eliadi, Jean Lafontaine, Arnold van Gennep, and Victor Turner, most prominently, all recognized in some form or another the central role that the acquisition of secret knowledge plays in the making of the initiated person, passed on in secluded spaces, such as the initiation hut. The difference with digital initiation is that these processes of learning are taking place while also actually in secluded spaces, namely homes and bedrooms, but through the wildly uncontained online platforms for audiovisual information sharing. As a result, every digital initiation right is slightly different because what one learns online is, of course, as we all know, personalized in multiple ways by the algorithmic feedback loops of the computational search. Nonetheless, the social outcomes of digital initiation, the forms of social segmentation that are rendered by the act of waking up are in each case identical. And here I would just like to share one image, um, which is an analytical drawing of mine um, to communicate this particular tripartite sociogenesis um, that I represent using the pronouns most commonly used to describe each social group. So I'm just going to try and share my screen here. I hope this works. Can someone just let me know that you can see the image? Yeah, we can. Great. Thank you. So I just kind of walk, use this as a sort of prop to walk through this, um, these forms of segmentation. So anons have always described themselves as a we. Becoming anonymous means agreeing to join this we collective. And the most obvious example of this is in the adage that accompanies their actions um, that many people now know, namely, we do not forgive, we do not forget. But this appears, this appeared in the, uh, in the ethnography in very many multiple ways. Um, upon waking up, they discern and discover the presence of an adversary um, that is called by many, many, many different names, but can be condensed into the pronoun they. And they consist in the broadest terms of people with some degree of power, people who run corporations, who run nation states, anyone with some visible degree of influence over the world that they are inhabiting. So in the very simplest terms, the knowledge one acquires on waking up is fundamentally a discovery of power, of the existence of power. And I'm aware that many people um, would, would reach for the language of conspiracy theory to, to describe this process, but I, I myself don't find that, um, for, with respect to this research, a constructive means of understanding anthropologically what's happening here, because um, 
it can serve to, to diminish the very real relations of power that do exist and that do dramatically shape people's everyday experiences. Um, with the caveat, of course, that the theories of power uh, that anons have and those of myself and other political anthropologists and social scientists in general do significantly diverge. Um, so the pronoun they is this space of power in which complex political dynamics are commonly reified into specific human beings. The you, the large category in the bottom, is the audience of their political interventions, both on and offline. Unlike other social movements, the major audience of Anons is not constituted by political representatives nor by the media, but by other everyday people in their own social environments. So this can be strangers in public streets and squares, or it can be people they know very well, such as their own friends, kin and affines. And so once Anons have woken up, um, their main political project becomes the attempt to awaken this you who are still sleeping, i.e. they do not possess this hidden knowledge that is held by both of these two categories, we and they. Um, and I just want to add a few words on the fault lines and the shape here. Um, so there are two cross-cutting binary distinctions that produce this tripartite universe. Um, the first, as I have explored, is between knowledge and nescience, um, the people who know and people who don't know. Um, and the second fault line is between morality and immorality. Um, the collective anonym of anonymous understands itself in strong moral terms, while their adversary is considered to be lacking any moral substance, um, indeed to be actively maleficent. And indeed, you could probably pull this line down into the middle of the U because the, the, the category of the U has this, has this Janus faced quality in that it's people who have the potential to be moral or immoral. Um, so this process of transformation that they describe as waking up and I theorize a digital initiation produces what Georg Simmel in his seminal essay on secret societies calls the apartness of these organizations. It produces this, these lines, this dynamic of differentiation. And the processual nature of this dynamic, I think is much clearer in the original German and, and Simmel's word, Herr Aussonderung, the sundering, literally the pulling apart, um, which takes place through knowledge and the distinctions between the people who have it and the people who don't. And the last thing I would say about this image is that although anonymous is of course ideologically egalitarian, this is also a hierarchical dynamic. Um, hierarchies of knowledge, just like hierarchies in general, are often analytically suppressed in the 21st century for one reason or another, but this hierarchical dynamic is is critical to all forms of ritual initiation um, and this distinction between the knowing ones and the not knowing ones. Um, and so there's always a kind of structural tension between Anons and their audience, because at one level, they want to bring this audience in to acquire this hidden knowledge that they have and become part of this we. And on the other, they can get quite frustrated with them because this group is unaware of its own nescience. So just to bring things to a close, um, I want to reanimate this distinction between secret and hidden knowledge because what differentiates a secret society um, and the collective of anons is that a secret society is bound by the preservation of secret knowledge. Um, I can just see Sarah pop up on the screen. Do I have one more minute? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to stop you if you're in your conclusion. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm just, just reaching a conclusion, yeah. Um, so the secret society is bound, this apartness is produced by the fact that they share this secret knowledge, while anonymous is bound by the value of exposure, of revealing hidden knowledge in order to enail, enable moral renewal. And there is another, and so there is another antithetical dynamic at work John LaFontaine argues that what is really being learned in the course of an initiation rite, which as every anthropologist knows, can take 
very brutal forms in some instances, is submission to the ritual authority that is orchestrating the initiation. By contrast, what is being learned in these digital initiation rites that take place beyond the control of any ritual authority is the rejection of authority itself. So it may actually be some years before, before we really see the long-term effects of these rights on digital societies and what new folks, new social forms may emerge. Um, and so the title of this talk is also, um, as Sarah said, the title of my forthcoming book. So there are lots of directions in which this discussion can be expanded and I'm looking forward to questions. Um, and I'm also really looking forward to the other presentations from Errol and Aoife. Um, I'm actually dialing in from Prenzlauerberg right now. So I think we all share a Berlin connection here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Um, perhaps you could just stop sharing your screen. Okay. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. And I, I mean, I was thinking about um, kind of other kinds of non-official movements in in the totalitarian or, or in the authoritarian societies that I've that I've explored and, and whether there's something similar going on with this this we they you kind of distinction as well um but we can maybe think about that in the questions um so we'll move on now to um a paper by Dr Errol Saglam uh, from the Freie Universität in Berlin um on the topic of uh, knowing the secret conspiratorial socialities politicization and masculinities this paper then explores how conspiracy theories de deploy secrecy as one of the central themes and how knowing a secret opens up multiple occasions to fashion one's political subjectivity in an act in affective and corporeal ways. Um, Errol is a social anthropologist working on masculinities, bureaucracy, statecraft and societal violence, as well as on collective memory and intangible cultural heritage in contemporary Turkey. He is currently a lecturer at Istanbul uh, Medeniyet University, uh, Rosa Luxemburg postdoctoral fellow, uh, fellow <laughs> postdoctoral fellow, that was my Essex accent coming out there, um, postdoctoral fellow um, at the Free University in Berlin and a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge. Um, his most recent publications deal with the intricacies of anthropological research with radical right groups and how societal violence and paranoid vigilantism maintain and augment the state. Um, and his monograph with the title Narrating the State, Conspiracies, Masculinities and Everyday Politics is to be published by Routledge in 2023. Thank you very much, Errol. Um, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Sarah. And then hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot to Grit for the organization as well and having me here. And uh, I quite enjoyed actually the um, previous speech by Rita. I'm a bit sick, so I will just take it a bit easier. I, like, you know, I hope you don't mind. And then, by the way, my speech might be in dialogue with the insights and the questions Rita brought up, actually, especially this term binaries between uh, us and them. Uh, my presentation today is titled uh, Knowing the Secret Conspiratorial Socialities, uh, Politization and Masculinities. And I will talk about how knowing the secret as invoked by conspiracy theories may actually be an occasion for selves to forge themselves as potent and sovereign subjects. Before I move on, uh, I would love to present uh, my conceptual and methodological framework maybe, which I think is also like affecting the way I formulate and deploy my research questions and then subsequent analysis. We must all be rather familiar with conspiracy theories these days, especially in the last decade, we have seen the unprecedented visibility and credibility ascribed to conspiracy theories and the sheer power they now seem to exert over politics and society at large. The socio-political implications of Keir Nunn or Pizzagate on American politics is now clear to everyone, I guess. The effects such conspiracies have, uh, the effects such conspiracies have uh, on society been made, have been made evident on January the 6th, 2020, when those who claimed that the election had been stolen raided the US Capitol to prevent the certification of electoral results. The US, no doubt, is not alone in this regard. Many other sociopolitical settings, ranging from Russia in Eastern Europe 
to Southeast Asia are now deeply and radically shaken by unsettling reverberations of conspiratorial narratives. And yet, still conspiracy theories are treated as a symptom of crippled epistemologies. That is, they are taken as a misrecognition of the social world, quite similar to myths. In their analysis, for instance, uh, the Harvard scientists like Sunstein, Sunstein and Fermule underline, and I quote, conspiracy theories typically stem not from irrationality or mental illness, but from a crippled epistemology in the form of a sharply limited number of informational sources, end of quote. Here, of course, the prevalence and credibility of conspiracy theories are designated as a problem of informational supply, arguing basically that people who are misinformed and manipulated are in this situation because of the informational environment and landscape, which of course, this situation can be remedied with fact-checking and a reassertion of the supremacy of scientific and presumably singular truth. Anthropological analysis, I would argue, beg to differ. My speech today and my wider research project on conspiratorial narratives attend not to the factuality or truthfulness of these narratives circulated, but to the sociopolitical dynamics undergirding them, as well as to their sociopolitical reverberations. That's why I term them such accounts as conspiratorial narratives rather than conspiracy theories, since the term conspiracy theory automatically and inevitably brings in a discussion of epistemology and truthfulness, dismissing the account at hand as wrong and absurd from the very beginning. Hence, I do not try to debunk these conspiratorial narratives when I encounter them, or view them as reflections of the narrator's inability to grasp a fast-changing and very well interconnected world. I rather suggest taking conspiracy theories as social practices through which ordinary people engage with the wider world and forge their political subjectivity in public. I also underline that conspiracy theories are not simply false narratives circulated by those at the fringes of society. More and more, I'm sure you will also agree, they become part and parcel of the mainstream and can create concrete sociopolitical problems ranging from the generation of vigilantism to the outright rejection of health-related regulation, as we have seen in the case of anti-vaxxers. Then the question, of course, uh, emerges, how do they operate? How is their secretive just implicated in this productive social interplay. As I did my field research in one of the strongholds of Turkish nationalism in Northeast Turkey, I noted how almost all my interlocutors often circulated conspiratorial narratives. These accounts pinpointed secret machinations of malicious foreign powers that incessantly threatened the country and then the state in particular, of course. Although my interlocutors were of different generations and had considerably different educational attainments, political moral orientations, socioeconomic capital occupations, they all circulated conspiratorial narratives and seemingly agreed that the, the country or Turkish state faced many invisible yet imminent threats. They also underlined how they were to be alert against such covert threats and in case the occasion arises they should be ready to do whatever they could do to counter such malicious endeavors by foreign powers. The content of these narratives, I must underline, included a diverse range of matters, including economic downturns, military fatalities, popular protests or dissent in general, bodily capacities, sexualities, climate change or changing agricultural patterns. In the event of a nationwide power cut, for instance, my interlocutors claimed that the incident occurred because of the manipulations of foreign powers to hinder popular support for Erdogan, then Prime Minister Erdogan. Although the Ministry of Energy later announced the technical fault to be the cause, their narrative did not change. Similarly, when two military aircrafts crashed, crashed during training, many of my interlocutors confidently asserted that the collusion must have been the work of American or Israeli military, sending a message to the Turkish government not to challenge their hegemony, which they claimed what the Erdogan government had been doing. When a minister reported that the initial analysis indicated an accident, none of my interlocutors bothered to change their stance or narratives. And one of them instead questions whether the minister was actually working for these very malicious uh, foreign powers. For him and many others, the crash had been caused by foreign powers to sabotage the ascendance of Turkey, the rest was either a lie or a cover-up. 
Similar narratives were widely circulated among my interlocutors to explain the economic dominance that the foreign power, powers are trading to manipul manipulatively lower the value of lira. Social political crisis that you know, those who are uh, protesting against the government are paid uh, by I don't know, European powers, or Germany in particular, and the socio-historical processes, you know, the, the founding treaty of uh, the Turkish Republic has secret clauses preventing us from 100% uh, using all the natural resources that we are deprived through this kind of secret um, clauses. Conspiratorial narratives they deployed reveal the secretive kernel of a great power play, and my interlocutors seem to believe that they knew something that others simply did not. And yet, alongside remote and abstract issues, local concerns too were accounted for through such narratives. For instance, my interlocutors often complained of foreign spies who allegedly visited the area to gather both information about the region and samples of local species of plants and animals. Israeli spies, they confidently asserted, came as tourists pretending to be sightseeing, whereas for locals, the real, true objective was clear, to steal the seeds of endemic plants and eventually have a monopolistic control over them. After a number of such visits, locals intervened, I was told, and then the security forces detained and deported these spies. And yet, Israeli spies found imaginative ways in response, I was told. They came again, but this time they pretended to be tourists wandering in short, while they specially designed sticky socks collected seeds. My interlocutors urged each other to be uh, vigilant as patriotic citizens against the malicious work of spies disguised as tourists to protect the natural wealth of the country. Landscapes my interlocutors dwelled in emerged as an extension of the nation, while citizens took it as their duty to detect such secretive threats and stop them. In a similar vein, some of my interlocutors who had worked in the construction sector in several North African countries told me how homosexuality was per pervasive among Arabs. The West, they claimed, injected this decadence into Arab societies to weaken both the religious integrity of Muslims as well as, as well as their virility. Many others claimed that the West had been trying to weaken the bodily power of Turks through this introduction of genetically modified seeds. Locals incessantly asserted that the changes in the genetic structure of seeds negatively affected their masculinity, as well as the local women's fertility, thus having an immediate impact on their bodies, actually. Then how are we to comprehend this revelation of a secretive plot as deployed by conspiratorial narratives? I suggest exploring the circulation of these narratives as social practices through which my interlocutors forge themselves as political subjects and generate concrete sociopolitical reverberations. Here, three radic uh, rather conventional characteristics of conspiracies should be mentioned before we moving on to a discussion of their peculiar relations to nationalist politics, societal violence, and statecraft. First, intricately shaped by politi political and international developments, conspiratorial narratives present captivatingly easy answers to complex questions. How economic downturns are explained not as symptoms of complex political economic systems, but as secret manipulations of sinister foreign forces, for instance, may be taken as an example. Passing such accounts onto others, also marks the narrator as someone who knows this secretive kernel uh, vis a vis like more ignorant others, quite similar to Vita's um, you know, V, they, and you actually. Second, such narratives seem to be refutation proof, operating independently of, the, uh, uh, of truth. How my interlocutors insisted on, insisted on the narrative of a sabotage by so foreign forces in the case of a power outage or aircraft collusion, despite the statements by officials by these to, to the contrary, illustrates this point. Evidence to the contrary often fails to alter or eradicate the original conspiratorial storyline. And thirdly, Circulating such narratives produces a paranoid nationalist outlook that is structured around the differentiation of a national benign us from the enemy malign them. Through passing on these narratives, my interlocutors induct themselves as Turkish subjects within this binary matrix of nationalist imagination and reiterate their allegiance to the national cause, which is not good to me. 
these seemingly evident and conventional implications of the circulation of conspiratorial narratives, however, do not account for the peculiar mode they operate in contemporary Turkey, where they command a strong, strong appeal despite their seemingly evident epistemological def deficiencies. I hence underline two more idiosyncratic ways the circulation of conspiratorial narratives generates the important sociopolitical reverberations. First one, how such enunciations forge the political subjectivities of men in public. And second, how they command the perlocutionary force issuing a vigilante violence. Although conspiracy theories are conventional, the first one I'm, I should elucidate a bit more. Although con conspiracy theories are conventionally geared towards the revelation of a shocking truth that's normally secret, it's more of le less stale as well, as in the case of Jewish conspiracies. Conspiratorial narratives I followed in the field lack stable kernels and have an ever changing content that seemingly carry little weight, especially vis a vis their social roles. I shall recount an example to illustrate this intriguing difference. Uh, one night in the field, when one of my interlocutors with strong nationalist convictions excitedly shared the news with us that Russian President Putin converted to Islam. This happened in 2015, by the way. As Putin and Erdogan were allies at the time, he connected Putin's alleged conversion to both politicians' opposition to Western imperialism. The rest of the group, all members of the local um, local uh, AKP organization, which is AKP, is the party of Erdogan, uh, agreed. Another one of my interlocutors said it was not surprising for a smart and righteous man like Putin to find the right part and confront the West alongside Ad Turkey and Erdogan. When I wanted to check the source from the which they got the news, though, I only saw a piece from a satirical news article. When I told my interlocutors that the source was actually a satirical website, the men still insisted that the news was to be true. They further speculated that even if this particular news piece were not true, Putin must have converted nonetheless, and probably kept it secret because of the possible backlash from the West, the Russians, and then the Orthodox Church. Intriguingly, the proof against the claim seemed to have uh, further proliferated. As is the case with rumors, conspiratorial narratives, I have hence underline, operate through their enunciation and social transmission without necessitating any form of factual validity or logical coherence. The content of these narr conspiratorial narratives is transient and unstable, altered in tandem with narrators' wider sociopolitical alignments. Narratives around Putin's conversion to Islam, for instance, were uttered when President Erdogan, whom my interlocutors revered greatly, was on good terms with his Russian counterpart. When relations between, between the two soured in the aftermath of a downing of a Russian warplane, however, this positive image of Putin was immediately reversed and my interlocutors rebranded Putin as the Red Crusader arm of the West. Thanks to this structural in independence of truth rules and con content influx, even the evidential reputation does not undermine the narrative's investment in conspiratorial narratives. My interlocutor's disregard for truth and, the, and reputation in such narratives, however, should not be considered simply as a reflection of the inability to, to grasp a changing world or as simply as false consciousness. I would rather argue that the circulation of such narratives among men should rather be taken as a social practice through which narrating selves, one after another, could be inducted as political subjects in public. Hence, the ultimate function of conspiratorial narratives rests on this uh, public reiteration of one's identity as men who knows secret uh, men who know secretive things. What matters most within the social dynamic is to be seen enunciating a secretive narrative, regardless of the facticity of the account, and pass it on to, of the, pass it on to others, others, like the audience as well. The act of narration produces a political subject within a network of autonomous and knowledgeable men without necessarily relying on, on the truthfulness of what is uttered. The circulation of conspiratorial narratives among men thus should not be traced through their to the alternative truth they claim to approximate or build, but should be conceptualized as instances of political discussion, political action, and the fashioning of political identities in public setting, settings in the presence of others. By narrating conspiracies in this sense, the speaking self is inducted as a political subject who knows secrets.
Second, complementing these forgings of political subjectivities of the narrators, conspiratorial narratives my interlocutors circulated present us with a peculiar pattern that set them apart from what is conventionally depicted as conspiracy theories. They act as means through which men are forged as potent actors that actively confront the subversive others in the name of the state. Through this characteristic, I highlight how conspiratorial narratives are not solely informational content to be passed on to others, but command what uh, Vina does call a perlocutionary force, which generate two significant sociopolitical reverberations, vigilantism and paramilitary violence. The narratives my interlocutors claim to reveal, uh, claim to reveal the invisible machinations and threats, urging the listener to be vigilant and in case the occasion arises, confronting the threat directly. In line, I underline the perlocutionary force such conspiratorial narratives generate. And um, uh, this is like, you know, the Vina Dasa's formulation in her exploration of rumors. Drawing on Austin's articulations, thus argues that Perlocutionary force of words underlines their capacity to do something by saying something, through which words come to be transformed from being a medium of communication to becoming bearers of force, causing things to happen. Generating a paranoid social milieu, conspiratorial narratives seem to both engender the very sociopolitical effects they pronounce and render violence a thinkable response in the face of imminent threats, even for those who did not directly participate in the violence. Conspiratorial narratives both engender, engender the sociality that is imagined to be threatened by mal malicious and malign forces, and calls on the audience to pass on these narratives to perpetuate the paranoid milieu within which violence is bound to occur, even when the narrators may not themselves engage in. That's, uh, that's why I'm, yeah, this was my articulation actually. And, um, I'm trying to understand how um, the conspiratorial narratives, like a you know, secretive kernel, is actually not an informational content solely, but also like a social practice through which both the subjectivities are and then the sociopolitical reverberations are generated. I will stop here. And if you have questions, we can take the discussion later. Thank you so much, Aris. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, Kind of disheartening in the sense of either than um, hey, but how do we kind of contradict these conspiratorial narratives if if it's not not an informational thing? Um, but that's again maybe something that we can we can have a think about it in the discussion. Um, so I'm going to move on now um, to introduce uh, Eva Niklian uh, from the University of Oxford um, and her paper on the Ariadne fabric uh, exploring the relationship between Stasi and Samizdat. Um, so using material culture as a theoretical framework, Eva's talk presents Ariadne Fabrique as a controversial case study of the relationship between the Prenzlauer Berg scene and the East German state security. Uh, Eva is a final year doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford, funded by a Leverhulme doctoral scholarship. Um, she's interested in 20th century German and Austrian literature, um, specifically literature after 1945, um, and her specialization lies in the unofficial literary scene of East Berlin and the concept of GDR Samizdat um, or self-published literature. Um, her most recent publication is a co-authored introduction uh, to the o Oxford German Special Study, uh, Oxford, Oxford German Studies Special I Edition issue um, with the title German Studies at Oxford, Archives and Utopias of a Community of Practice, uh, which sounds fascinating. Um, and she's also currently collaborating with Russianist uh, Dr. von Zitzewitz um, at New College, Oxford, on an article focusing on the role of women in transnational semester. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. The, the virtual floor is yours. Perfect. Um, I hope to keep it at 15 minutes, like might go to 17, so I try to whittle it down as much as I've I can. I've been far more permissive <laughs> than I intended to be, so 17 will be fine. <laughs> Okay, fine. Um, perfect. So can everyone see the, the active presentation? I need to start the slideshow, but I'm currently, I've got a split screen, so I'm just trying to make sure that everyone can see. Can everyone see that okay? Um, yeah, we can see it's not in slideshow mode at okay. the moment, but we can see it. I'll just start, um, start from start. Okay. Okay. Well, that's slightly tricky though, because I need to, I have my paper here as well. Um, sorry, I haven't done this on 
I'm so it would it be okay if I just keep it on that setting currently which is the slides and I go through can everyone still see that and then yeah I think that's fine as long as there's not an enormous amount of text because it's quite small okay yeah no don't, don't worry it's many many nice pictures um Okay, um, so yes, lovely to be here today. Um, in this talk, I will introduce the um, complicated relationship that many Germanists have with the literary legacy of GD or Zamizdat. So I'll present a brief case study of one of the more controversial unofficial magazines from the GD or a magazine called Ariadne Fabric. Its infamy is ultimately due to the magazine's complicated and until 1991 covert relationship with the East German secret police, so the Stasi. So I guess this is where it ties in quite nicely with what Errol and, and Vita have been speaking about, uh, this whole idea of revelation. Um, so just briefly some terminology housekeeping, although some of you might already be familiar with this area of study, I just thought I would quickly go through some acronyms. Um, so obviously GDR, German Democratic Republic, DDR, Deutsche Demokratische Republik, SED, Sozialistische Einheitspartei Deutschlands, and then the MFS, the Stasi Staatssicherheit. Um, <clears throat> fascinating, strange and troubling. These three words headline the Guardian's review of Philip Alterman's most recent book, The Stasi Poetry Circle, which was just released two weeks ago. Alterman's book ultimately offers an account of how the Stasi decided to use poems as a mean, means of fighting capitalism. <clears throat> and yet, in the rest of the GDR, in the shadows of this ideologically regulated and Stasi regulated literature, another creative scene was beginning to flourish, the underground the un or the unofficial scene. But how and what exactly do we know about the relationship between the Stasi and the writing that was not published by state that was not published by state approved writers? Um, what did unapproved literary works look like and how did they feature in everyday cultural life in the GDR? So let's start at the end of the story after the dissolution of the GDR and contextualize. On the night of the 15th of January 1990, about two months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, East Germans streamed into the secret police headquarters in Berlin. Once in, they began looking at the first of many, many files. But what exactly did they contain? Who collected this information, how and why? And what exactly were they? So the files detailed personal information about almost every citizen in the GDR. Some files contained what might be, you know, we might think is innocuous information about people's everyday life, you know, for example, their employment or marital status, but other files reflected a far more intense personal observation from the state. So their political or private ideological sympathies, details about personal affairs, friendships, lifestyle choices, and so on. For many people, the revelations of the Stasi files cast long shadows over their lives. In the cultural scene in East Berlin, the most shocking revelation of the Stasi file concerned the gentleman on the right hand side here in the black and white, uh, Sasha Anderson. So as a Stasi agent, Anderson actively passed on information to the East German authorities about the unofficial cultural and private activities of his friends, many of whom included artists, writers and actors. The sense of betrayal and bitterness felt by many East Germans certainly marred the beginning of a united Germany. <clears throat> the revelation of Anderson and another Stasi agent called Reiner Shedlinski's activities as inoffizielle Mitarbeiter ultimately sparked waves of articles from East German critics and writers alike, who seized upon the opportunity to condemn, dismiss or discredit the entire experiment of East Germany's Bohemian enclave. Before we understand or indeed analyze the specific role of Ariadne Fabric in this controversy, we must first look briefly at the structures of power in the GDR when it existed, since this contextualizes the opening of these files and the circumstances that led to such a widespread embittered response to them in the 1990s. Um, so in March of 1951, the SED declared socialist realism the official state literature of the GDR. In order to formalize and establish the cultural agenda, the Ministry of Culture was established on the 7th of January 1954, with Johannes Becher appoint, appointed as First Minister. Against this backdrop, it, it's really that we begin to encounter this whole idea of official culture as the adopted and promoted culture of socialist realism in the GDR. The Ministry's task was to ensure uniform cultural policy in the fields of literature, literary policy, um, publishing, film, theatre and music. Given that the East German authorities believed that the writers and the artists were an intrinsic part of the large scale attempt to use culture to shape the German socialist future, they became targets for surveillance. For as Stephen Brockman noted, every work of literature was also a political speech act, 
meaning that literature and writers exerted their own kind of power beyond the boundaries of traditional tangible politics. The East German regime realized that since the intelligentsia wielded so much power um, over public kind of, and a, so much power over the public and had kind of authority, you know, writers really required organizing and controlling politically. So in regard to literature specifically, in practice, the regulation of the official public literary sphere was enabled through a strict permission to print act, along with a hierarchy of censorship within state publication houses. This meant that at a grassroots level, each manuscript or book submitted to a publisher was subject to an almost labyrinthine process of proofreading approvals or indeed rejections. Separately, the establishment of the Deutsche Schriftstellerverband, so the Writers' Association, created a kind of informal peer review system within the literary sphere of the GDR. Membership to the association could lead to mentorship and publishing opportunities, but membership could only be attained by being nominated and seconded by existing members. Those who were part of the association had to tread a narrow path between freedom of expression and not questioning party politics. So as you can really see, the pattern of surveillance in all of these instances relies on administrative gatekeeping. But in order to enforce this Kulturpolitik, the East German authorities relied on the Schild und Schwert der Partei, so the Staatssicherheit. In keeping with East Germany's position as a client regime of the Soviet Union, the MFS and its various sub-departments used similar frameworks to the Czechist or the Soviet secret police. In the MFS, surveillance of culture was the task of two sectors in the largest of the ministry's departments, the Hauptabteilung XX, which was responsible for the state apparatus, church, culture and sport, and the Hauptabteilung XX9, which was eventually then the department for political underground, uh, underground activity. The Stasi were quick to realise that the best source of information about writers and artists and intellectuals were indeed other writers, artists and intellectuals. The inoffizielle Mitarbeiter were among the most important of the Stasi spies, since these citizens were invariably trained by the Stasi themselves in the art of deception and espionage. The Stasi recruited its sources from deep inside official circles, such as the Deutsche Schriftstellerverband, as well as from the fringes of society. The Stasi touched, therefore, on the lives of virtually every budding, middling, middling or indeed established writer in the country. Um, um, as the decades wore on, the artists and writers based in the Prince Sarabera began to search for new ways to escape censorship and disentangle themselves from the rigid social and cultural conformity set out by the authorities. Private homes were turned into venues for galleries and dramatised readings, workshops were held in inner courtyards, cellars and loft spaces, and later even churches. These became concert venues and theatres. As Birgit Dalke noted, Hope you can read that. Um, readings and performances, often followed by long discussions, took on the atmosphere of spontaneous happenings and frequently developed into parties. Participants would drive out to derelict farms in order to take part in plein air painting events, hold punk rock concerts or fashion shows or witness body art performances. Um, um, the non-institutional non and anarchic style of these events was precisely what attracted young people to attend. Artists and writers who found themselves excluded from the official publishing channels of East Germany began to collaborate to create posters and small print runs of magazines. At first, these publications were absolutely guided by the principle of make do and mend. They were often made of recycled materials containing photographs, handmade prints and hand typed texts of poetry and prose. And they were sometimes you know, stapled together to form a book or indeed simply left in loose sheaves of paper in a card folder. The invariably limited nature of each print run meant that per issue, there might only be anything between 10 to 40 copies of each magazine. So once crafted and assembled, the magazines were disseminated first among those involved in the making, as I suppose their pay payment or whatever. And the editors of the magazines would then go and hand deliver issues to yeah, contributing writers or others who were kind of interested in that kind of literary scene generally. Um, they'd usually kind of either hand deliver them or you know, there might be a poetry reading, in which case they would just give them out in person. So whatever remaining copies um, you know, were left after giving them out to interested parties, would then, they would then be sold to the West, um, either to kind of literary enthusiasts uh, or private collectors in West Germany, um, or as late, you know, in the late 1980s, basically they would sell them to state libraries, which is an interesting thing in and of itself. 
Um, so to give you a, a sense of kind of the modus operandi of one such magazine, so I'm, I will introduce you to Ariadna Fabric. So the founders or kind of editors are two men called Andreas Kotziol, still a poet and writer, and Reiner Shedlinski. Also, Sasha Anderson, uh, the man that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Inefitziella Mitarbeiter, though technically he wasn't an editor, he was just a, an influential figure. The magazine was based in East Berlin, um, and it ran from roughly 1986 to 1990 and had about six issues per year. The publication style was academic or essayistish, uh, and it tended to feature artistic works, like one or two, like not very many, but it was overall a textual magazine. Um, so total issues were about 24, and there is a kind of very iconic cover design that you can just about see in the picture. I'll the next slide is better, um, made by Cornelia Schleimer, so the very well-known uh, German artist. So the production process. Um, in order to make this magazine, um, Shedlinski and Coetzee, all the editors, would ask certain writers and artists to contribute. They would submit a work, um, and if this work needed typing, then this was Coetzee's job. And he, I did an interview with him, he was complaining about how long it used to always take him to type out every single manuscript, because of course copying wasn't as easy. Um, and once he had co copied out maybe 40 copies of each text for, you know, going together in the magazine uh, himself. So Kotzio, Shedlinski and Anderson, interestingly, would assemble in Shedlinski's fat and put together all the papers um, in the order in which they wanted them in the magazine. Then Shedlinski would deliver the manuscripts to the Staatsbibliothek, uh, where his girlfriend at the time um, was working in the conservation and bookbinding department. And so she would actually professionally bind this magazine to make it really beautiful and well put together. Um, and so they're really quite lucky to have that because not many magazines would have had such beautiful binding. Um, and this is how effectively the magazine was made. Uh, just to give, I suppose, a flavor of, of what the magazine was, was like in terms of literature, you can see I've copied in here the contents page. I'm sorry that this is so small. I didn't realize there'd be an issue with screen sharing. Um, but you can see that there are about six articles there. You've got Jan Faktor contributing. You've got another article from Elke Eob, again, a very well-known writer of this, of this era um, and a mentor to many young writers, um, kind of all writing different texts. Uh, and I'm just going to show you briefly Jan Faktor as a little zoom in. Um, you've got Jan Faktor. Unfortunately, I've just cut off his head. So it looks like he's got no hair. I'm sorry. Um, but Jan Faktor, his article was uh, das Hauptproblem der Literatur ist das alles schlecht schreiben um, and so went on to give out about you know this and so in some ways you know um, this is you get a real sense of the style of writing by kind of looking at just a quick snapshot even at this article mainly because it's this whole idea of engaging with the concept of literature and theory and I suppose literary creativity beyond that and yet it's still kind of peppered with personal opinion and it's maybe even a little bit polemic as well. And so in some ways, as you read this magazine, you are actively participating in the community of practice, of literary practice that was going on by agreeing or disagreeing or, you know. Um, so yeah, so throughout the whole magazine's existence, um, so this is actually maybe a fun quote, I'll read it out, hopefully you can see it. So this is a, just, a, I just highlighted this because I thought it was a fun quote. Um, but basically, das Hauptproblem der Literatur ist das alles schlecht schreiben. Literatur hat nur einen Sinn als Zeugnis darüber, dass es jemandem gelungen ist, das Gefühl der eigenen Überflüssigkeit zu überwinden. Alles andere ist nur depressives Dokumentieren des Arbeiteifers. So it's, you know, again, it is very polemic. He's kind of going out in a limb there and saying, right, well, you know, this is every, everyone's just terrible at writing and you know, it's all kind of an ego trip in some way. Um, so this is a sense of it. Uh, but Ariadne Fabric was certainly one of the more kind of professional uh, magazines, as I mentioned, due to the nice binding and so on. But there were so many different types that existed on the scene, just to show you a, a, a little snapshot of the different covers that there were as well. Uh, you get a sense of vibrancy. Um, you know, you've got Ariadne for Brickshaw, you've got Adrai, Herzataka, Mikado, and so on. Um, and then so just thought I'd briefly show you this. I did a printing workshop during the week with some, some of the students that I have. We kind of did a Sami Stat style poster making event. Um, and it was really so exciting because they, they kind of got inspired by the, the different covers of all the different magazines and, uh, and so on. So that was quite amusing. Um, 
So coming back to this idea of Samizdat, so how exactly does this relate then really to Ariadne Fabric and other magazines in the scene? So by definition, Samizdat means the production and circulation of texts without the involvement of the state publishing houses and the censor's office. The phenomenon's origin can be attributed to Nikolai Glaskov, who as early as in the 1940s, distributed self-bound typescripts of prose and miniatures to his friends in Russia. Samizdat is therefore understood to have functioned as an outlet for 20th century writers who could not publish their text through official publishing channels. Um, <clears throat> so in East Germany, this we really get a, a kind of interesting case study here when it comes to Samizdat for two specific reasons. So first, unlike the majority of other countries within the Eastern Bloc, East Germany benefited from a unique direct access point to Western culture via West Germany. In Berlin specifically, the proximity to the West was especially palpable. The relatively easy access to other Western media sources, therefore, and the fact that these sources were in the German language also stands in stark contrast to the situation in other Eastern Bloc countries. The second reason has to do with autonomy and the culture of Zamizdat. So in Russia, the culture of Zamizdat became intrinsically linked with the notion of freedom of speech and autonomy. This was largely due to the fact that some of the most sought after Zamizdat works were you know, by such literary titans as Boris Pasternak of Dr. Zhivago and Alexan Alexander um, Zolensen, whose famous archipelag gulag charted his experiences of a Soviet gulag for having written an anti-Stalinist letter. So although these are only two examples of the many different Samizdat soul words, um, both Pasternak's and Zolensen's writings totally conveyed it disillusionment with the Soviet regime and were consequently banned texts in the USSR. The official print runs of these texts specifically came to symbolize, therefore, a fight for freedom of expression in the Eastern Bloc. And as such, the linguistic term for self-printing, Zamizdat, became a phenomenon synonymous with writings of a set subversive bent. So why are we using the term Zamizdat in the context of the GDR? And what has this really got to do with Germany's when it looks and sounds like something that is so exclusively Russian? Well, the answer is in fact that Zamizdat is also, was also a phenomenon in other countries in the Eastern Bloc, and it also provides German scholars with a useful term to engage in critical literary comparison and evaluation. Um, since Borgia, if not Adorno before him, the concept of aesthetic autonomy has been a complicated philosophical question. In the debates surrounding the autonomy of the unofficial scene in the GD, GDR, before and after the Stasi revelations, any attempt to consolidate a clear idea of the implications of the term have been foiled by a lack of agreement on what exactly autonomy means in the GDR official magazine context. After the Stasi files became official or became public, it was revealed that two of the magazine's editors had in fact been prolific inefficiella mitarbeiter. The literary legacy of Ariadne Fabric was reduced to a blunt, blunt, repetitive chronology of betrayal. The extent of what Shedlinsky referred to as, um, or Kotsio referred to as Shedlinsky's doppeltes Spiel was one that spanned almost a decade of deception. So unsurprisingly, the contemplation of the relationship between Ariadne Fabric and its literary autonomy brings forth particularly bitter feelings. Over 30 years on, attempts to understand what happened are almost still confounded by feelings of personal betrayal and disappointment. Um, in an interview with uh, Andreas Kutziol, I'm moving towards the conclusion, don't worry. Um, in an interview with Andreas Kutziol, uh, he reflected on his time as co-editor <clears throat> of Ariadne Fabric with one of the most infamous in Fitzi Mitarbeiter. And he, his initial statement, <clears throat> excuse me, kein Mensch kann Dichter oder Denker und gleichzeitig denunziant sein, is redolent of what Karen Lieder described as the hailstorm of rhetoric that emerged as part of the Neudeutsche Literaturstreit in the early 1990s after these files became public. And yet inadvertently, his words go right to the heart of the debate about Ariadne Fabrik. Research into the magazine and indeed other magazines necessitates a confrontation with the legacy of a literary experiment and the reckoning with emotive personal histories associated with the magazine. In recent years, countless attempts have been made to dramatize and depict cultural life in the GDR. TV shows like Deutschland 83 and films like Das Leben der Anderen and indeed books such as the Stasi Poetry Circle. However, as scholars, we must be mindful not to allow a popular fascination with the Stasi, its authority and power, so, com so to completely dominate our assessment of the literary practice of readings, performances and artworks that were so, that arose from this unofficial scene. 
The strength of this GDR Zamiz dance scene is that its literature gives us a political pulse of the time, whereby the intersection of official ideology and its detractors has the potential to give us a sense of where cr what creativity looks like in the context of socialist dictatorship. As we slowly deconstruct the many narratives of trauma associated with each individual magazine, we learned that not every person involved in this literary experiment was engaged in cynical power plays. For some, it really was a labour of love and an expression of faith in the power of community, creativity and ultimately German literature. Thank you very much, Aoife. Um, can you just stop sharing your screen? Oh, sorry. I might be able to do it for you, hang on. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, well, thank you um, very much to all three of our speakers. Um, and I noticed that um, Anselm has just been uh, doing some simultaneous translation in the chat there, if, um, if anybody um, wasn't sure about the German. Thank you, Anselm. Um, okay, uh, are there any kind of immediate questions that people want to ask of any three of our, th any of our speakers or all three of our speakers? Uh, I think what, um, what kind of unites the papers uh, or, or common thread across the papers is, is the kind of role of secrecy in um, identity building and particularly group identity building. Um, so, um, Vita, that was quite, it's, that's quite clear that well, knowledge and the re revelation of, 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 of supposedly secret knowledge um, is uh, kind of identity building and, group, and also group building um, within your context. Um, and then an error of the same that you that the kind of revelation of, of apparently secret knowledge or the, the, the gathering of, of knowledge, those conspiracy theories, um, was part of political identity building, um, is, if I've understood your argument correctly. And then um, Aoife, um, as you were speaking, and um, yours is the context, of course, with which I'm most familiar, um, the, uh, the, the secrecy, the, the need for secrecy, or this presumed need for secrecy in terms of producing the magazines, producing the Samizdat, was also a community building event. And that's, that's what we're finding in our research as well, that um, it builds, uh, it, you, it, it has to be founded on some a certain degree of trust with the members of the community and and that trust is related um, to the agreement that the secrecy is going to be sustained uh, and then I think that's one result one result of then the revelations that the founding members of the group were not sustaining that secrecy um, was um, one of the reasons that you see these really angry responses um, after unification um, so I'm not really sure my question lies in here. I, I, I think specifically to Ethan, I, I think it might maybe relate to the others is, is what happens when, so I mean, there's a contrast here. I think that, that the group in the GDR is supposed to sustain the secrecy, whereas in the other two cases, the desire is to induct other people into the secret. So you have a kind of a contrast there. Um, if it would, I, I mean, I think we, we tried to interview, we, I say, we, I say Tara, who I think is still here. Um, I tried to interview Anderson and he, he wouldn't talk to us. Um, I wonder, do you have any sense of, of what he got out of kind of breaking the secrecy of breaking that community building? Um, perhaps I'll leave you to ask that and I can see Anderson has got a question as well. Um, yeah, I suppose Anderson is probably one of the more difficult people to, to catch uh, and talk about this. Um, I, I have actually managed to get in touch with him and he said he's willing to talk, but I don't know what he's going to be saying, you know, because obviously he had that film that came out, Sasha Anderson or something, like, or is it even just Anderson, um, about, you know, his perspective on, on the whole thing. So, so your question is, what do you think he got out of it? Um, I need to talk to him and, and ask him that, but I suppose um, there's there have been so many different hypotheses as to, you know, well, were people doing it because they themselves felt like they could help the system or improve the socialist system in the GDR you know there's so many different motivations that people would have had to have been involved and what they're getting out of it well I suppose like well monetarily sure I mean Anderson did manage to get some money he had access to he had managed to get travel visas and to get money um you know products that I suppose he might not have been able to have access to in the GDR if you were on waiting lists um materially like sure there were benefits but I suppose in terms of 
um, in terms of his own kind of like spiritual what he got out of it like holistically like I suppose potentially that the notion of kind of being able to represent or bridge between the official and the unofficial and maybe there is a level of ego in that that it felt good to be like the person that both sides kind of were coming to um but I'm not sure if that really answers your question um it's not a question that that maybe you can answer I'm not even sure if you'd get an answer out of Anderson either um certainly there's not one in his autobiography which is a read um but uh, I'm gonna hand over to Anselma he's got a question as well Great, thank you. Um, those were three really great papers. I'll just quickly try and take my hand down again. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So I was. Um, I have one question, which is um, for each of the three speakers. So I, I hope maybe three uh, the three of you can talk to, and then I have uh, two more specific questions: one for Vita and one for um, Ifa. Uh, which I hope is okay. So Vita was really interested in hearing when you started talking about the connections between um, anonymous and American evangelism. Um, so I've just started reading the book of Jerry Falber by uh, Susan Harding, which is on uh, fundamentalist language in, in fundamentalist church uh, in the United States. Um, and, and that strikes me as, as very interesting. I mean, there is also the, the politicization, especially with Jerry Falwell uh, and the fundamentalism that he was able to, uh, um, to develop uh, or to shape. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, um, in particular, that connection. Um, for Eva, I was wondering, um, with the uh, the presence of EMs uh, in the production of Ariadne Fabric. Um, I was wondering about one point which, which you may or may not yet have insight on. Um, I was wondering when it comes to MFS involvement through EMs or otherwise in uh, groups or organizations or similar in the GDR, um, I wonder if there's a difference between surveillance on the one hand, which can be done through EMs and similar kinds of mechanisms. And on the other hand, the attempt to direct what is going on within those groups or organizations. So in the church, which one of the studies looks at the East German church, the church province of Saxony, because there were, there were people um, who were not just EMs, uh, but it went further than that, who were sitting in a quite high level in the church administration. There was a concern that, in fact, the Stasi had not only conducted surveillance on what was going on to find out what was going on, but had actually actively tried to shape the work that was being done, so the content. Um, and I was wondering if, if you have some kind of sense to what degree uh, that also is the case for our Yatna Fabrik um, or not. So, and then in all three papers, I was wondering about this relationship between revelation and concealment, which we started to also talk about in the last webinar, um, you know, the classic literature um, on secrecy. So um, Durkheim, Zimmel, uh, and others talk about that secrecy develops its power through this tension between concealment and revelation. So showing a little bit and then concealing it again and showing a little bit and concealing it again. And that becomes the thing that is, is, makes it interesting or makes it scary or makes it threatening or makes it something that we want to know about. Um, so this is how the power of secrecy or the people who are doing the, se the secret um, or holding the secret that is where it comes from. So I was wondering if each of you could reflect a little bit on this tension between concealment and revelation in relation to um, the case examples you talked about. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Anselma, for your questions. Shall I start? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So it's, um, it's a very long, long story. Um, the history of American evangelism, which you can you can trace back to what which gets, I mean, there's a there's a book on conspiracy theory by I think it's Daniel Bar Barcoon. Um, Errol may know this better than better than I do, but which traces back the history of actually of these of conspiracy theory to forms of um, 19th century um, sort of British uh, 
Pentecostalism that, that gets imported to the US and takes off um, in the 40s and 50s and essentially kind of flourishes in little pockets across the US and actually also imports from Europe um, a, a kind of potential for the certain neo-Nazi directions that some of these can go in. Um, um, but I think the way the way this comes out in anonymous, I mean, the thing that they have really in common is the is the millenarianism, and that's the thing that I didn't talk about explicitly. Um, but it's, I mean, the, the the great sort of battle that they consider between this us and them dynamic is a millenarian dynamic. Um, you know, it's sort of between good and evil, and there's there's a dynamic of you know the world is about to end and uh, but you can take up this struggle and um uh you know become part of this moral community who are actually trying to preserve um the social and moral order um so there's this kind of imminent threat of of future death which they call in this theory of of depopulation that the world is actually um going to is is being intentionally depopulated by this um cabal um so i think that's that's where you can see the the link between the very clear link between um histories of of particularly american evangelism and ideas about the antichrist and how um this then gets secularized into essentially a a, a profane conflict between um yeah the the, the saved and the and the not saved um but it's very i mean because of the online nature of these discourses um it's it's very very it has, you have to acknowledge how it's very difficult sometimes methodologically to be able to situate these discourses in certain regional spaces i mean i was studying britain obviously um it's so it, it's it's not always easy to say for sure that this is coming from america but you can just see that there are very close analogies. Um, in terms of the question of secrecy and revelation, um, yeah, that's 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 central to the dynamics and anonymous. Um, uh, secrecy is is bad. I think that you could say that 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 would be their view that anything that's secret is bad. Everything has to be revealed, um, and the search engine is a great way to do this um, because it sort of has this gives these kind of dynamics of feeling that everything is being revealed constantly um, even in really small ways so uh, when i interviewed people you know they had done research on me and on my funding agency and you know they would kind of share this information like oh yeah you know like i've looked into you <laughs> so and it wasn't in a threatening way but it was just this dynamic of rev revelation was just so central to to the movement that everything kind of fell within it everything um yeah everything everything should be revealed and uh yeah so 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 absolutely would agree that's 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 really important thanks Lisa. um perhaps errol if you want to uh, address that question the same question so the question about secrecy and, and revelation and the, and the role that that plays in in your research i think it perhaps it's the same kind of dynamic um as the feature that everything should be revealed uh yeah i think in a sense there is this kind of um you know the revelation of a secretive kernel of, you know especially in terms of international relations they are my introductors are obsessed you know the giving the the gist you know the uh, in turkish they always say you know let me tell you what is really going on because the, what we see on news is like apparently the facade and it never shows the real thing and then they always claim to know something going on behind the curtain in this sense there's a really strong investment in revelation but you know the in in, in a quite i don't know maybe contradiction to rita's arguments you know the secrets are good as well because it is an occasion for them to claim this kind of political subjectivity who knows things you know the, who knows the, the the real i don't know deal almost so they in any case of course most of stuff i don't know i'm an outsider i don't debunk these kind of theories actively but you know as an outsider with like you know kind of perception of the world some of them are absurd and then they change nonsense. So they, if you ask me, they don't believe in these kind of you know, the revelations themselves always, 
But um, that's why they reify nonstop some kind of, even though they are absurd, there's this kind of secretive things that they claim to, you know, just kind of bring up to the, like the light almost. So, but, but it's, it's a bit different, I would say, uh, because the dynamic, for instance, if you think about Pizzagate or QAnon, or even the, you know, this kind of anti-vaxxers, there's a really sensational, outrageous claim there, and then there, the tension between the, you know, the secret and then revelation is really strong because, you know, the, they claim this kind of really monstrous, almost like a super evil uh, secret. But in the Turkish case, everything is a bit like more ambiguous and the tension is not so much on the, like, you know, there's something really evil going on, but, you know, the, uh, let me create a secret almost to reveal for yourself as well. So it's just like a, it's a bit like retroactive, rather than, it's almost like inverted version of the other one. But yeah, this is it. I don't want to take too much of your time. So it's, um, is the kind of revelation the performance then, is it? Is it a performance of revelation rather than... If you ask me, yeah, well, my claim in my article is always, you know, it's an induction, almost, uh, you know, the, there is no point for them to, you know, because, you know, they can say, you know, Putin did it, and the next day they can say, America did it, actually, US did it. And then the, it can be coming from the same person. And then uh, when you, if you confront them, and I don't know, the agricultural policy and this genetically modified producers are actually a state policy. And then they change the agricultural patterns and then they, in order to increase the, I don't know, agricultural efficiency and fertility, they introduce these things via state institutions. And at the same time, everyone knows this, but they still claim that, you know, the, uh, that it's like an um, you know, Israeli plan almost to have control over. And when I once I said, like, you know, but you said, the state did it actually. And then they almost look at me like, so why do you even bother? You know, this is like an interplay between the people mm -hmm. and let me tell a story. And then through this, I create a secret. And the revelation is primary there without even secret. You know, through revelation, you create a secret that you don't actually believe in yourself. Yes, yeah, so, so the revelation is that there is a secret, that there's yeah. a secret world that is going on. Yeah. So. Yes, and it's the performance, the revelation, the performance is more important than the content of the. Definitely. Book. Yeah, it's a practice itself. That's why I was like, you know, how we understand them as like a relational, almost performance of man, especially. Of course, I, I think it's really masculine in a sense to claim to know, almost, you know, to have power and to have the power to confront this you know, evil force that you create like, imaginatively. Which then I think leads to Anderson, back to Anderson, and the desire to like perform. I think, I mean, that there's elements of that, I think, in his behavior as well, the performance for yeah, his. I, I think so. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I completely agree. And like even I, I really liked what Errol was saying that, you know, it's kind of this revelation. It's kind of an performance performance. It's almost kind of masculine, like I always knew or something like this. And it kind of makes me think a little bit like maybe it's a bit cynical of me. But, you know, when we have people turning around and like, you know, in the 1990s, having said, oh, well, you know what? We all kind of knew we all knew that there was something fishy about that. And it kind of it filters into this kind of literature uh, like basically that happens then uh, in the newspapers. So on a really public platform as well, which is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I suppose just to come back to so the concealment and revelation, I mean, I had the benefit of, of being able to listen to what everyone was saying before me and think, oh, that's quite clever. I like that. Um, but I think um, it's really it's a really muddy one in the GDR, particularly because on the one hand, like you kind of know that, you know, there's this kind of, I suppose, feeling that everyone knew that in a group of maybe 10 people, that there was always going to be maybe one person who was likely working for the Stasi or who had some connection there. And so in some ways, there was always this kind of tacit acknowledgement that you were being monitored by someone, you didn't know who, um, but there is always that kind of sense of maybe self-censorship anyway, like on a more public scale. But I think maybe the sense, the revelation, the reason it stings so much, particularly in this case, is because I suppose these people really believe that they were among friends, right? They believe that they were the we as opposed to the they that like Vita was talking about. Um, and so I think that's the that was the really difficult part. And also like, I think, you know, on a, on a really kind of, like basic emotional level you know as I mentioned a lot of these people were in relationships with each other and like you know they in one editorial group you might have like it, it was usually quite like incestuous like you'd have people kind of you know being with each other and you know having a great old time of it because it's bohemia and like sure why not but like you know there is a real kind of deep connection here and I suppose like 
particularly I suppose when you're in your your younger I don't know like what sure what do I know but like when you're in your younger days particularly if you're kind of you know talking and sitting up late talking about like post-structuralism and you're kind of really getting into the nitty-gritty of academic discussion and you kind of feel you've got this like youthful intensity as you speak and there's this real kind of in some ways this romanticism to the whole thing um and so therefore I suppose the betrayal feels even greater because you feel like you have shared a a really emotional kind of connection with these people over an extended period of time and maybe you know physically like romantically who knows and so I guess that's where that was why the revelation was particularly I suppose painful as opposed to it just being like well we all kind of knew um and then I suppose the other question that Anselma had uh, if I'm saying that right Anselma um was you know surveillance versus direction um you know to what extent was the content of these magazines influenced from the get-go and you know I think that's a really good question because it's it's kind of still unsure on the one hand like there are like I've been looking at a whole bunch of Stasi files and there are files that's that you know Shudlinsky met with his handler and his handler was like you know I think we should write a bit more about pro-structuralism because it's going to tie everyone in knots and like you might as well it'll kind of be a kind of a happy distraction so that people won't be writing anything too politically dissident um on the other hand you know you also have other files that detail like um issue by issue who wrote what and that there is literally like a bericht at the end of like right well this is the report we think that this was a bad idea make sure that this person doesn't write about that again and so on so on so on the one hand you do have influence on what's happening but it's usually kind of after the fact of some, something, someone having written something and they say, well, actually, we're not really into that. We don't really want that sentiment being put into the public sphere. So you should make that not happen again. So in some ways, I wonder if the earlier issues are perhaps more independent and then it gets honed um, into more of a machine, I suppose, Ariadne for brick um, uh, as time goes on. I hope that gives some clarity. It's, um, I mean, it's... Well, firstly, the post-structuralism thing. Whenever I hear it in relation to the GDR, I can't help but think about the scene in um, Heaven DPR um, by Thomas Bosig, where the, the Stasi officers are really stupid and they don't realise that post-structuralism hasn't got anything to do with the post office. And so then they start conducting su uh, surveillance on the post office. Yeah. But, so I can't help but laugh every time I hear post-structuralism in relation to the GDR and then post-post-structuralism as well. Um, but yeah, the, the question of, you know, what what was the point of the observation was, what the point of trying to reveal the concealed secrets was, um, when only on a few occasions was anything really done, is quite an interesting one as well. Um, but I also want to hand over to Anselma. Um, thanks. Um, uh, if I, I was wondering also a little bit more about revelation and concealment in terms of the Ariadne fabric as a magazine itself, so not so much in terms of the revelation of MFS influence afterwards, but more as the, the in GDR times, you know, what to what degree was the magazine itself used for revelation, if if at all. If that makes sense. Do you mean revelation of like other literary texts or yes, like... that, that is the question. So it was a magazine that was produced to bypass state authorities can we link that to questions of revelation and concealment in GDR times or not? I th I just to jump in there, so what Tara and I have been looking at is literature as a kind of spectrum mm -hmm. of knowledge and revelation mm -hmm. um, and different ways in which GDR writers dealt with that or kind of approach the question of revealing secrets, particularly secrets about the Stasi. And you have a kind of one extreme where you have Stefan Heim writing a book that is about the Stasi um, and published, but publishing it in the West and therefore mm. to some extent concealing it from his readership. Um, and on the other hand, you have um, books that are written for the Schublade, that are written for the draw and not published at all. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're kind of reveal secrets, but then don't reveal secrets because they're concealed. And we, Sam, is that seems to sit somewhere in the middle. Um, so did Ariadne Fabric kind of reveal secrets or public secrets, things that were known about the GDR, but not written about no. in, in so, the literature. Right, so like comparatively, say if you compare it to other magazines, like say Mikado or like other magazines that are admittedly earlier on in the 1980s, like those ones would certainly have been, would have been writing lovely texts about, oh, how abundant is Amsterdam in spring, you know, and, you know, you, you should do this and do that. And like, we should basically just talking about 
the abundant West. Um, whereas an Ariadne Fabric is like almost certainly not. It's all kind of academic essays, it's opinion pieces, kind of similar as I mentioned, the Jan Factor piece. That's very much like, yeah, it's all peppered with opinion, but there's a certain level of kind of academic discussion going on. Um, some of it is is quite interesting, um, like, you know, kind of original thought pieces. Uh, some of it is just genuinely quite terrible writing by people who thought they're very clever. Um, so there's there's a real uh, there's a real mixture. But I think to answer your question, I don't think there, I don't think anyone would say, well, in order to find out the truth of the GD or I'm going to read Ariadna for Brick, like that really wasn't the agenda at all. It was literally just, oh, you know, if you're kind of interested in writing literature, be it poetry or prose, then this is a place in which you can kind of publish it and it looks quite nice. But, you know, unless you want to kind of interpret texts as, oh, maybe this could mean this or maybe this is biographically linked to the author in that way or this way, I would say that that was kind of I'm, that's really the only way that you could kind of find an interpretation of life in the East. Uh, and it would be very much like an interpretation as to opposed to any kind of secret report um, that would reveal anything. Um. Thanks, that's interesting. There, there raises the question of why it wasn't just published then. But um, that's, another, that's another question. I, I think, uh, Batil, you had, a, you had your hand up. You, did you still have a question? You need to unmute yourself. I keep forgetting this. Um, yes, um, I but that's going towards a different direction um, because I just wanted, there was a side um, in terms of um, Sasha Anderson. No? There was some question popping up, um, gender issues and so on. I thought, and that's actually only a side comment, one has to take into account that he was a real star of the Prenzlauer Berg. So people were uh, really looking up to him. So that's why the betrayal has become so dramatic in the end. You know, we also have to bear in mind that there, there were other IMs or well, writers, like female writers like Christa Wolf, who was then revealed as an IM, but the reactions towards her betrayal, so to say, were not as severe. And I think that has particularly to do with this profound masculinity as has been commented on, and this very specific um, kind of character of Sasha Anderson, who really kind of, uh, Yes, he um, he was a star to print our back. And I think these issues has probably have to be taken into account, maybe. Certainly he was a guru. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, please go ahead. No, I was gonna just say absolutely you no, know, like you're so right. He was really perceived as being like a guru of the scene. Um I suppose maybe also one could say that perhaps the dif difference between him and Christoph Wolf is that like ultimately. The files that Krista Wolf gave, like if you look at her Stasi files, like they were, they're really not very, they're not very many. Um, and I think maybe that also contributed to people like, oh, well, like you shouldn't do, sh you shouldn't do as much damage as Anderson did. Now, admittedly, some of Anderson's files have been destroyed at his request, um, you know, when things were kind of going quite bad. Well, when, when he went and moved to the West, just from what I remember. But, um, but yeah, so I think there's like, a, as you say, there's a lot of things to be taken into account. And he has been in denial for a long time because he, he thought that his files had been destroyed. So if you know, there are a few interviews um, out there. So he, he thought he was on the safe side and it yeah. was a long struggle. That's why probably he's refusing not to talk at all. You know? I mean, I, I think we could, yeah. I mean, Christopher did get a hard time with it as well. Yeah. I, yeah, she did, I mean, particularly before the revelations actually she had the really hard time of it um and um you're right that her file is is much smaller than anderson's and, and a lot older and she didn't really reveal very much either and um so there was a kind of less sense of of harm being done um but uh, and also she admitted it before she was forced to admit it and i think that makes a difference as well as only in, in the in there's an expectation that you reveal the secret yourself before it's revealed for you if, if you look at it in terms of informant behavior that it's better to reveal the secret yourself um than have it revealed for you by the files and christopher did that i mean belatedly but she did do that um whereas as anderson as, as patil said didn't denied it until it was undeniable um by the material that had been gathered um, but I don't want to take up too much time talking about Krista. Um, Joanne, you have your hand up. And then um, there's also a question in the chat, but I'll, I'll take uh, Joanne first and then we'll come to Anselm's question in the chat. I think they might well be linked because my question was also to Vita. I really liked 
uh, what you said about the difference uh, or your differences between the secret knowledge and hidden knowledge and the link that you made to between that and power. Um, and if I've understood correctly, you talked about secret societies and secret knowledge within that as being linked to kind of accepting certain hierarchies within those societies, whereas hidden knowledge was about revelation and being anti-power. But my question, which is why I, I wonder whether it will link to Anselmo's is, how anonymous conceptualize their own power then in relation to the knowledge that they reveal? Um, how, where, where does power lie for them in what they do and how they act within the digital or, or otherwise? Um, and I guess the, the question then is that, is it a gendered power in any way? Yeah, Vita, perhaps you could take the questions together as, as, as they're both for your paper. So what, what is power uh, for anonymous and, and is there a gendered dimension to that? Yeah, thank you, um, Joanne. That's a really, really interesting set of questions. And you even <laughs> give me some more insights, I think, into anonymous. Um, but first, the, the question of secrecy and power. I mean, this is something which um, I spent some time working on this project with, with Mick Talsig. And he, he, in his book on defacement, he certainly centralizes the connection between secrecy and power. And he draws, I think, on a kind of brief quote from Elias Canetti that secrecy is at the core of power. Um, and I mean, you certainly see this in relation to, to the state. I mean, this kind of argument that it's actually the, the secret state that's the most powerful, but I mean, that's a it's kind of long, long form connection. But um, yeah, I, I'm yeah, I'm fascinated by the, the connection that you've just made between the hidden, hidden, what revealing what's hidden as being anti-power, because I, I think that's absolutely what's going on. Everything that they're trying to reveal is, is, is ideologically egalitarian, is about exposing power. Um, they, they see themselves in diametric opposition to that. Um, I think as with you know, other kind of millennial movements that centered around revelation, there's, there's, a, there's a, an emphasis on the revelation and the revelation as the kind of central dynamic, but there's not always a lot of thought about what happens after revelation. Um, and I think that's where Anonymous as a political movement really became defanged because it actually, after you revealed something, say, you know, like Edward Snowden, you, you're relying on institutional mechanisms to essentially um, use that information to reform a given system. So Anons weren't themselves concerned with that. They were absolutely focused on the revelation and not with the kind of steady work of institutional reform that might happen in the wake of a whistleblowing revelation. Um, and so their own practical work, just to um, respond directly to your question about power, was with um, homeless people in Britain. So everything they did practically was about trying to um, sort of in pragmatic ways care for and look after people who were invisible, namely homeless people, on the streets of Britain, various and and they did a lot in this regard with you know with providing food and clothing and so on. Um, gender is always a tricky one with anonymous because the the first anonymous the first wave of anonymous was extremely gendered and extremely male and spoke to these kind of I think online spaces which were themselves very male. But the wave that I studied um, was I think showed was about the entry of women into Anonymous. And there, you know, I certainly interviewed a lot of female Anons, um, you know, and people who brought their kids to protests and so on. So um, it's more ambiguous um, because it was, it, it certainly asserted to be, um, you know, non-gendered non movement, but then obviously you know, just in implicit ways, men, men firstly tended to outnumber women by about at least two to one in any setting, um, uh, but also could be more discursively prominent. So I think there were imbalances there, but they were, yeah, they were, they were, they happened in practice rather than being openly uh, discussed. That answers your question. I wonder if we could put the same question to Errol in terms of um, the work that he's doing is what the gender, but she can elaborate a little bit upon the gender dimension there. Yeah, my, yeah, in terms of, yeah, I'm specifically working with men, to be honest, and then um, 
I think there's a masculine desire, the sense of like, you know, the conspiracies are um, deployed, just like in the public engagement, a performance of like a masculinity. And then in through this kind of reiteration of like, you know, the, let me tell you a secret about like, you know, how things are really unfolding actually, you know, what, what is the real deal here? I don't know, in case the um, military aircraft collusion or in, in, in probably in about the ongoing war as well, I haven't talked to my interlocutors now, but there's always this kind of really explicit um, masculine bias, I would say, or tendency, uh, especially in the Turkish case, of course, women are uh, somehow, even though not formally, but there's like it's kind of banishment from power. And then it's uh, explicitly the power itself is uh, explicitly associated with um, masculine positions and bodies. For me, this kind of revelation is always a masculine endeavor. I, it's, I work with women as well in the field, but it was not so common, I would say. Like the very formulation of this kind of, let me tell you what's really going on, the, um, seems to be explicitly uh, performed by, or like, you know, uttered by men, interesting. And that's why I was like following all my articles are actually, you know, how men um, first use these uh, conspiratorial narratives to forge themselves a subject, political subject, and then engage in political violence actually against dissidents. This can be the tourists. And then they literally lynch, by the way, um, tourists who they think that are subversive towards the Turkish state. And this can be like political dissent as well, if you are you know, in their eyes, um, subverting or like harming like the integrity and control of the state, then they personally target you as well. That's why um, I, I I think there's an explicit link in my case, but I don't know if it's always because you know, anonymous and all others are not. But I'm, but I suspect something going on because the very formulation of this kind of um, let me have the power and then the power through this power let me tell you the real deal about this kind of you know what's really going on here is different from what you actually see. I think there's a, you know, the, if, uh, because I'm personally invested in psychoanalysis myself, so like since my doctoral years, and I think there's a, you know, really psychoanalytic under, like, you know, the uh, underplay almost. It's, you know, you know the power, and we know what's going on, and then you have the power if you grasp, like, you know, the issue at hand, with like, and then tear it as it is. The, for me, this is explicitly masculine in a sense. There's always this kind of, um, it's almost antithesis of humility and then you know knowing your boundaries um, not reaching out almost. that's, that's but, really uh, interesting i mean i think in the um the case of the gdr as well as certainly in the literary sphere that there, there were female informants but there were far more male informants um playing that kind of role of of knowing of, of knowing one side knowing they but also knowing we um and playing the two off of each other in some ways that's a, an ill, uh, ill thought out thought that I'd have to think about a little bit more later. Um, but here, uh, do you have another question? Um, people could also, should also just feel free to pop questions in the chat. Um, yes, um, this is actually indirectly following up on this discussion now because now psychoanalysis has come to the fore kind of indirectly. Uh, but the question is towards uh, Vita. When I look at your scheme, which I thought, think is very interesting, um, the we, they, you, where do you locate the I? Have you thought about the kind of self? Because I can't help it. When I saw the scheme, I was thinking of Herbert Mead's kind of, um, you know, this the self, um, me and I, the, the distinction he made, he makes between the self, me and I. But I thought, is there any analogy? And and where do we see the self, in fact, in this scheme of we, they, you, you proposed? Thank you. That's a really wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I myself have never, <laughs> haven't studied psychoanalysis, although I'm fascinated by it. Um, and so I think my instincts, uh, anthropologically, are always to the kind of social relations. Um, but I mean, the self is really the whole, the whole triangle. I mean, the whole triangle is the self, because waking up is fundamentally a narrative of the self and of self-creation. Um, so the self, it's, it's the self that has these experiences. I mean, so, so the way they narrate it is that they go through these long and, 
um, you know, often quite very traumatic experiences. And it's through that experience of power um, in a pragmatic way that then, uh, then this is, this is what they come to. But um, yeah, you're right. The, the self is, is just, it's just the whole shape. And I think, um, yeah, I wouldn't know how else to put it, but they're certainly very, very focused on the self. Um, and so they have this kind of schizophrenia where sort of at one level it's, you know, we're a collective and we're, um, you know, we're, we're all together and we're all united. But I think in, they also have a very, very strong individualist discourse, which can sometimes make um, collaboration uh, problematic because they've all gone through these very individual processes of change so that the processes of change are individual um, but then they come out and they're part of this collective we and so I think there is also yeah there's a tension there that maybe someone more psychoanalytically trained would have something to say about um, do we have any more questions or comments, or comments that are disguised as questions. Okay. Um, and Summer, I don't know if you if uh, you want to say something about um, the next steps, next workshops. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> You'll have to unmute yourself again. <laughs> ha ha ha, right. <laughs> That's why nobody laughed when I explained that I might be disrupted by the dog who's next to me trying to get to his food. So, okay. Um, we have two more webinars in the session, in our series. The next one is on surveillance in relation to secrecy, privacy, and knowledge which is taking place um, on this Monday coming up. And then the fourth webinar, interestingly, on methodological challenges, which we've already been touch touching on today, is Wednesday next week. Um, both of them, 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, GMT time. So it would be really great to see um, many of you join us again for those sessions and contribute to the discussion. Um, I think we are seeing how some of the topics that, there are certain topics that come up every time we speak now, um, it will be good to see how those develop uh, as the series goes on. So thank you very much from me. I don't know if anybody else from the team wanted to say anything else. Um, well, just also thank you very much from me um, for three really fascinating papers, um, which have also um, given me and um, I think Tara said to pop off, but uh, yeah, she's not, she's there again. Um, as we start writing about secrecy or finish writing, I have an article that we've been writing for about a year now, uh, finish writing an article about knowledge and revelation and secrecy that's given us a lot of uh, food for thought in terms of the framing of that. So thank you very much um, to everyone. It's been really interesting. I can see there's some more, some more comments um, in the chat. Um, so that will be really good to have a look at these um, after the webinar and see yeah. if you can pick them up next time. There's lots you. of great comments on the question of gender and whether it's that women uh, are, are not producers of knowledge or whether they're more likely to um, reveal secrets, um, which is an interesting question. Yes, yeah. um, jo, uh, Joanne, you had uh, your hand up. Did you want to say something? Oh, I was clapping. Oh, you were clapping. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My eyes are going this time of day. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think we can close off there. And uh, you yeah, thank to our speakers um, and to Grip, the wonderful organization, as always. Thank you very much for the organization as well. Okay. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Nice to meet everyone. Bye. Bye.